Well, good morning. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is located after the book of Jeremiah, large book in the Bible, and then before the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to begin our reading this morning from Lamentations in Lamentations chapter 1. What a week of reading, huh? Lamentations and Ezekiel. Lamentations, or Ezekiel rather, may be, Ezekiel may be one of the, the few books that can make us long for lamentations when things were so simple. Lamentations chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She who is great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night, with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan. Her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper, because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her. Her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. All who honored her despised her. For they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her, of her future. Therefore, her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things. For she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. And all her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. Let's pray together. Father, we bow our hearts and our minds and our heads before you. And God, as we do, we thank you that you have spoken to us in your word even in a difficult word. God, we, we would acknowledge as we read it and as we consider it this morning, we would acknowledge that we need your help, that we need your Spirit. And so we would ask that you would send your Spirit among us to teach us your Word and to show us more of Christ, to lead every single person in this room. God, we pray that you would lead every heart in this room to a greater trust and a greater comfort in the person and the work and the blood in the cross of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We see in your notes that we are beginning a new section this morning. Last, the last section was uh, entitled, Faithful Prophets in a Divided Kingdom. But you'll notice that this morning we are transitioning into what is called Faint Hope for a Devastated Kingdom. Faint Hope for a devastated kingdom. And lamentations may well be the most faint that hope ever appears in all of the Old Testament. God had warned the people of God, it's what we've read over the past few months, that God had sent prophet after prophet. He had sent word after word, vision after vision, and He had warned the people of God to turn from their sin, to turn from their idolatry, and turn back to the living God to find mercy and grace. But they had, 
They had steadfastly refused the word of the Lord. They were, as the scriptures say, they were a stiff-necked people. They were rebellious to the word of the Lord. And even though God had been patient with them, and God had been long-suffering with them, historians and the Bible tells us in 587 B.C., under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, that the patience of God ran out. And God raised up that pagan king and that pagan nation to come and to devastate the people of God. And they came and they laid siege to the city and they ravaged the city and they destroyed the wall and they destroyed the temple and they destroyed the people of God. And Lamentations is really the blow-by-blow account. It's the most detailed picture that we have in all of Scripture of this, this huge event in the life of Israel, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and in particular, the destruction of the temple. And as I was talking and preparing this week, talking with others that were reading through the same text and reading through Lamentations and asking questions, what does this mean? What what does this have to do with us? And it just kind of struck me. The the, the real difference that we see in in our setting, even this morning, and what we read in the Scriptures. We have, most of us have, Almost all of us have very little idea of the nature and the, the severity of the sufferings that were going, among, going on among the people of God. And we sit here this morning in, in really in comfort and security and in a state of the evident blessing of God. And it just begs the question, for people like you and for people like me, what, is this, what does a text like this, how do, what does it have to do with our lives? How does, how does this picture of difficult and gruesome suffering of the people of God, how does it intersect with, with your life and with my life? How does, how does a book like Lamentations speak to us? Well, to see that, what I want you to do, what I want to do is I want to walk you through, just very briefly, I want to walk you through the crisis that we see in Lamentations. I don't, and I want us, as best we can, I want us to enter in to their suffering. I want us to, to hear their cries. I want us to, to hear their groanings. I want us to see the very suffering that the people of God underwent because of their sin. But I don't want to leave it there. I want us to enter into their suffering. I want us to hear it. But then I want also to hear the very comforting words of God that we find that David quoted in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. Not only do we suffer for sin, but even in the midst of that, even when we are suffering, we know that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That His mercies are without end. That they are new every morning and that the faithfulness of the Lord is great. There are people here this morning I am convinced. There are people here this morning who need to hear from this book that God is not too far off, that you, brother or sister, are not beyond the grace and the mercy of God. That there is a God who has set His affections upon you. And there is a God who in Christ has given us all the mercies that we will ever need. And there is a God who is everlastingly and infinitely faithful toward us, no matter what we have done. So I want to walk you through the crisis that we see in Lamentations, the comfort that we find, the Christ in Lamentations, and last, just a few challenges from this book. First, notice the crisis in Lamentations. The sin brought, the, that sin brought about suffering first, that was tragic. We see that in the book of Lamentations that sin brought about suffering that was tragic. And we notice it in the very first verse. Look again, he says, how lonely. Now, we, we, we don't know exactly who the author, historically, traditionally, it's been thought to be Jeremiah. But others have said, well, it's unnamed. But in any event, he was at least present and very involved in the suffering of the people of God. And this is what he says concerning the city of Jerusalem. He speaks on behalf of the people of God. And he says, How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How, like a widow, notice that word, like a widow she has become. She who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. It's interesting, if you read in particular the first two chapters of Lamentations, you see that over and again that the city of Jerusalem, the people of God, they refer to in feminine language. 
And so Jerusalem is referred to as her and as she. And we see that, for example, Jerusalem is called here in verse 1 a princess. In verse 6, she's referred to as a mother. In verse 15, as a daughter and as a virgin. Over 20 times in the book of Lamentations, we find references to the people of God, to the city of God, in those kind of language. Virgin, daughter, mother. But the very first reference is none of those. Rather, she is referred to as a widow. It's just evidence, a reminder for them and a reminder for us how far sin will take us apart from the presence of God. How very much our sin will cost us in terms of our relationship with God. She was a daughter among the, among the nations. She was the very daughter of God. She was the apple of God's eye. And now in the very first verse, he says how lonely she sits. She is like a widow. We see that their suffering was tragic. They had, they had fallen far in their relationship with God. But also we see that their suffering was just. Not only was it tragic, but we see also that it was just. And this is, where, this is where we need and we have to differentiate the suffering that we see in the book of Lamentations from, for example, the sufferings that we would find in the book of Job. You remember Job 1, 1 says that Job was blameless and upright. He was one who feared God and he shunned evil. And so there was absolutely no necessary connection between the sufferings of Job and excuse me, between the the righteousness of Job, the character of Job, and the sufferings that he endured. There was no necessary connection between his character or the things that he had done and the sufferings that he was enduring. That's why we call it a, a righteous suffering or an innocent suffering. But that is absolutely, fundamentally not the case when we come to the book of Lamentations. Their suffering was in direct relationship to their sin. We see it, for example, in verse 8. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 1, verse 8. Jerusalem sinned, you can underline it, note it, it sin, Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, notice the therefore, she became filled. It doesn't mean that she just became dirty with sin. It means that she has now endured the punishment of God. All the, the wrath of God is now resting upon her in such a way that she is now filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness, and she herself groans and turns her face away. Again, in verse 18, we see it even clearer. Chapter 1, verse 18. We see the just punishment of the Lord. Verse 18, the Lord is in the right. I love that line. The Lord is in the right. And as a side note, this is, this is really something that, that we all, that I need even more in my life to cultivate. Just a quiet, submissive, humble spirit before the Lord, even when the hand of the Lord is against us, even when we do not like, even when we do not like what we have before God, our natural tendency is to rebel and to chafe at the discipline of God. But we want to, to cultivate that in our own soul, to be humble and submissive before God. He says in verse 18, the Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my sufferings. My young men, young women have gone into captivity. They discovered with tragic and devastating consequences that God always keeps his word. He said he would bring, he would bring devastation if they did not turn from their sin. And that's precisely what we see in the book of Lamentations. Their, their suffering was tragic. They had fallen far in their relationship with God. Their sufferings were just. They deserved them. And then related to that, number three, their sufferings were God-given. Their sufferings were God-given. This is one of the things that strikes me more than anything as I read through the book of Lamentations is the affirmation, the deep confidence in the absolute sovereignty of God even when it is not seemingly working for us. When that, when that providence is a difficult one, when that, when that sovereignty is, is something that brings the hand of the Lord against us, there still remains a deep, abiding belief in the absolute sovereignty of God. Yes, God uses means, and so God raised up Babylonians. It wasn't God that was, as it were, shoving the spear into their hearts. But no doubt God was sovereign over every single detail 
every single matter that occurred in 587 B.C. In the same way that he's sovereign over everything that happens in our lives. We see it, for example, that confidence expressed in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 37 through 39. It's one of the, it's one of the most striking affirmations of the sovereignty of God that you'll see. 37 and 38 says, chapter 3, Who has spoken? And it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded. It seems you say, who has spoken and it can't, who has spoken this destruction? Who has spoken this destruction of the temple? The natural answer would be King Nebuchadnezzar. He has spoken and it has come to pass, but they recognize that Nebuchadnezzar is nothing but in the hand of the Lord. And so they say, who has spoken and it come to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come. When we are disciplined, brothers and sisters, when we are disciplined, it is not a random event. It is not a random accumulation of circumstances. It is the hand of God. He says, we see that their sufferings were just, they were tragic, they were God-given. And number four, we see that their sufferings were severe. That their sufferings were severe. Now don't you turn to Lamentations 4. And we could look at a lot of different places in Lamentations to see the severity of their suffering. But I think maybe Lamentations 4 captures it better than any other, any other text in all the book. It's some of the most gripping language, some of the most gripping images that we see in the book of Lamentations. Listen to, listen to what they were enduring as a consequence of their sin. He says, How... Verse 1, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. What does he mean by that? Verse 2, the precious sons of Zion, worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. Verse 3, even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young, but the daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives it to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who are brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom which was overthrown in a moment. No hands were wrung for her. And then notice down in verse 10. The hands of of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. It's one of the most disturbing images that we have in all the Bible. And it begs the question, at least it does to me, and I suppose it does to you, why do we, why do we, have, why do we have this in the Bible? You know, the truth is we do not have this in the Bible simply for our curiosity or simply to fill in the gaps. If you've been reading through the Bible, you recognize that we've already encountered a couple of weeks ago, we've already encountered the fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. At the end of 2 Kings, the story is recounted. And then again, at the end of 2 Chronicles, we have the fall of Jerusalem. It begs the question, if we already have that in the Bible, if we already have those accounts, why do we have what we have here in Lamentations? What is the point of this book for us, for them, and for us even this morning? I would suggest to you this morning that that we do not have the book of Lamentations simply for the history that it relates, but rather we have the book of Lamentations for the questions that it raises. And I want to show you those questions at the very end of the book. Lamentations chapter 5. It's where all of it kind of heads as we move through the, the first lament, the second lament, third and fourth, until we get to the very last chapter of the book. And I want to I show you where the people of God are. 
Now we're going to come back to chapter 3 and we're going we're to look at an affirmation of faith. But I want, you to, I want you to notice the tension that we find at the very end of the book, the questions that they are asking. Lamentations 5, verses 16 and following. It says, The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this our heart has become sick. For these things our eyes have grown dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. And at that point we want to say, yes. Your throne does endure forever. But notice the question. Verse 20. Why do you forget us forever? And why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore to us, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. You see it there in your notes. Yes, their sin brought about suffering, but their suffering brought about questions. One, that were profoundly intense. Are we forsaken? They ask the question, are we forsaken? Yes, the Lord reigns. And yes, the Lord is supreme. And yes, we believe in God. But are we related to that God any longer? Is the covenant, as, is the covenant destroyed? Are we cut off from God? Are we forsaken? Questions that were profoundly eten- intense and questions that were eternally significant. Can we be forgiven? Can we be forgiven? Verse 20. One, restore us to yourself, O Lord. Verse 22, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. You know, those were, those were reasonable questions. I mean, you, you, think about, you think about all that we have looked at as we've read through the Word together this year and all that you now know, all that we see of the people of God and we see that in a moment, in one, in, in one event, in one year, there is no longer any Jerusalem, no prophets, no priests, no sacrifice, no temple, no king, no food, and no water. They have lost every sign, every evident sign of the blessing and the presence of God. Because of their sin, they have forfeited the intimacy that they once had with God. They have They have endangered their very relationship with God. They are far off from God. And it's at that point, brothers and sisters, where we see that they are far off from God that I believe that the book of Lamentations leaps off the page and into our lives. I know there are many people here this morning who would say that I have made an absolute mess of my life and I have sinned and I have I feel as though that I'm no longer close to God I can remember times when when I felt an intimacy with God I know that there have been times in my life when there was a closeness an intimacy a relationship with God that was vibrant and that was lively, but because of sin, I no longer feel the same way. There are people in here that are struggling with sin. There are people in here that are deeply afflicted by sin, and it may not always be an external reality. There are, there are people here this morning that are struggling inwardly with all manner of sin, and that sin is driving us away and away and away from the presence of God. And the book of Lamentations comes to us and says it doesn't have to be that way. There is there is comfort in, not in your circumstances, com- not comfort in anything about you. There is comfort in God. And that's what we see in Lamentations chapter 3. So I want you to turn back. It's the verse, it's the verse, they're the verses that we are by far the most familiar with. In fact, I would submit they're probably the only verses that we are familiar with in the book of Lamentations. Probably for good reason. But it's interesting, just, 
from a structural standpoint that all five chapters, except chapter 3, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, they all contain 22 verses. They all contain, begin with the first letter of the alphabet, or excuse me, they all make their way through the Hebrew alphabet, except for chapter 5, but they're all shorter, except for chapter 3. It's as if chapter 3 is accentuated in the book and said, this is, this is the center. This is where the center of the book is, and this is where you and I, brothers, this is where we need to center our lives as well. Read with me, if you would, in Lamentations 3, verses, we'll begin in, really in verse 18, and then read all the way to verse 24. The culmination of all the suffering, he says, my endurance has has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. Writing on behalf of the people of God, he says, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. And then verse 19, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood, it's it's a word for poison, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. I am absolutely beaten down. He said, my prayers are unanswered. Darkness has, wall, uh, darkness has overtaken me, walled in, cut off from God. But 21, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Therefore, I call this to mind, verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. What do you do when you are separated from God by sin? What hope do you have? What hope do we have when we are separated, cut off from God by our sin? First, I want to I I show you the strategy that we see here in these verses. First, we must find comfort in the fresh mercies of God. We must find comfort in the fresh mercies of God. The end of 22, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. I love the imagery here for that word mercies. It's, it's taken the same, it's the same root word for a mother's womb. And so there, as there is an intimacy between a mother and, her, and a child, there is the same kind of intimacy, there's the same kind of compassions that exist from the Lord to His people. They are new every single morning. Not only, not only does He tell us about the nature of their, compassion, or their mercies, that there is compassion in the Lord, but He tells us that we cannot exhaust the mercies of God. Isn't that good news? We can not exhaust the mercies of God. Now, some of us are trying our best to do so. But we will never exhaust the mercies of God. Richard Sibb said this. He said, He said, There is far more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. There is far more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. Us. Why is that the case? Why, is, why can we count, how can we be certain of fresh mercies when we have failed, when we have sinned against God? How can we be certain that God is going to be merciful toward us? Let me give you two reasons he, that, he, that he, we see in verses 22 and verse 24. Number one, because it is rooted, these mercies are rooted in the unfailing love of God. How can we be certain of the mercies of God? Because they are rooted in the unfailing love of, of God. The steadfast love, verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's the word that we see over and over in the Old Testament that speaks of the covenant love of God to His people. The idea is that God has set His affections upon us. There is no, there's no explanation for that. In fact, if you read in Deuteronomy chapter, six, chapter 7, why, why, why have I chosen you, Israel? Not because you were greater, but because I've loved you. The steadfast love of the Lord, God has set His affections upon His people. A couple years ago, I was, I was preparing to preach uh, on John 3.16, and I was thinking through just, just how we, we, we really, we doubt the love of God. And we think about, you know, other people. God loves other people. Certainly God loves this Christian or that Christian, but can God really love me? You ever thought that? 
And we think about all the things that we have done, all the ways that we have failed God. And There's no way that God could love someone that has done the things that I've done or even is thinking the things that I am thinking even now. When I was preparing for that sermon, and for a, for a sermon illustration, I guess, the Lord, the Lord gave uh, that night we were, I was preparing and I heard a cry and I went in and I found out that, that Rachel, had, excuse me, that my two-year-old, Johnson, had slapped my five-year-old upside the head. A little display of the love of a brother and sister. And so I, I went in to Jonathan and, uh, and I disciplined him. And so he immediately began crying and he ran to his mother and said, I love you, Mommy, I love you, Mommy. And Rachel, trying to intervene and make some family peace uh, at five years old, said, well, Jonathan, remember, you, you love Daddy, too. And he said, no, I don't. And so I said, well, son, I love you. And I just kept saying that, yeah, and said, yeah, I know, I know you love me. No, I don't. And I just kept repeating that. I love you. I love you. He kept repeating, I don't love you. I don't love you. And, you know, I knew in a couple of minutes that he loved me again. But never, never for a moment did I even consider stopping loving my son, stopping to love my son. And I thought of Matthew 7. I know the context is, is varies there. It's a little different, but... Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he said, Which of you, fathers, which of you, if, his son, if your son asked for bread, would give him stone? Or which of you, if he, if he asked for fish, would give him a serpent? And then Jesus turns and he said, If you, fathers, if you then, being evil, in other words, in comparison to God, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Our Father in heaven will give good gifts to those whom He loves. And I just thought about the fact that I'm not nearly the Father that I should be. I never will be. And certainly, according to that verse, and rightly so, in comparison to God as a Father, I am evil. And if I, an evil Father, would not stop loving my son, how much more an infinitely good, an infinitely gracious, an infinitely awesome and sovereign God, how much more would that God never, ever, ever stop loving you, brother or sister? The steadfast love of the Lord, it never, ever ceases. And the mercies of God are rooted in that love. They are rooted in the unfailing love of God. And two, they are rooted in the unceasing faithfulness of God. They are rooted in the unceasing faithfulness of God. The one consistent thing about us, the one consistent thing about us is that we are never consistent. We promise one thing, and before the sun sets, we have broken that promise and many others. But it is not so with God. Every single promise God makes, and in the context here, the promise to love us with an unfailing love and to give us mercies that are without end and that are new every morning. In this context, the faithfulness of God, it will never end. Great is God's faithfulness. Every single promise that He makes. Every single promise that He has made, He will keep. Not a single one of the promises of God will fall to the ground unanswered. And out of that come to us over and over, washing over us like the waves on the seashore, the mercies of God. Mercies of God rooted in the unfailing love of God and the unceasing faithfulness of God. And notice how that gives rise to what we see in verse 24, a settled hope in the provision of God. 
gives rise to a settled hope in the provision of God. Verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. It is striking, is it not? If you look at verse 18, where he, the same writer has said, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. And then you look over to verse 24 where he says, Therefore I will hope in him. No hope in verse 18, hope, abundant hope in verse 24. And the only thing that is ch- changed, don't miss this, the only thing that is changed is his mind. He has set his mind. And again, this is not the power of positive thinking. This is the power of believing in the promises of God. He has set his mind on the love of God, which never ceases. He has set his mind on the mercies of God, which are new to us every morning. And he has set his mind on the great faithfulness of God. And now he has hope. There is no better strategy for you. There is no better strategy for me. When you feel feel far off from God, the answer is not personal reformation. The answer is God. It is a meditation upon the character and the love and the grace of God. It gave rise to a settled hope in the provision of God. And it gave rise, excuse me, and it gave rise to a deep confidence in the character of God. Gave rise to a deep confidence in the character of God. Look at, look at verse 31 and through 33. For the Lord will not cast off forever. He has reminded himself of the love and the mercy and the faithfulness of God. And so now in verse 31, he can confidently declare, the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he caused grief, he caused it, he will have compassion, same word, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He's just restating what he's already said. And then verse 33, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. Do you see that? He says in the very same, he says, he causes grief. The Lord brings it about. Why? Because God will not leave us in our sin. Praise God. He will not leave us in our sin. But he will discipline us. He will bring the hand of the Lord against us. He does cause grief. But notice this. He says, he does not, in verse 33, he says, he does not willingly do it. He does not, literally, the the idea is he does not do it from the heart. Isn't that a great picture? That even though he causes grief, even though he disciplines us, he does not enjoy doing it. He He does not enjoy afflicting us or bringing us grief. There's a settled hope in the in the provision of God, but there is also a settled confidence in, in, in the character of God. And all of this leads to what we see there in your notes, an urgent desire to repent before God. That's where I want this to lead in my own life. It's where I want this to lead in your life as well. It leads to an urgent desire to repent before God. Look at verse 39. This is, this is the progression that he walks through. He, he sets his mind on on the promises of God, settled hope in the character of God, and then, out of that, we see verse 39. Why should a living man complain about the punishment of his sins? Verse 40, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. I don't want, I don't want to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want us to to look at the book of Lamentations and come away thinking, you know, there's a lot of gruesome things, there's a lot of bad things in that book. I never quite read anything like that. I don't want to read that and be unchanged. I want to read that and I want the kindness and the goodness of God to lead me to repentance. To lead you to repentance, to turn from our sins, though it may be small in our eyes or though it may be great, to turn from whatever God would reveal to us that we are in opposition to his ways, to turn from those sins and to avail ourselves, brothers and sisters, of the great and inexhaustible mercies of God. To turn from God, to turn from our sins, to turn to God. That's the bottom line. Now I want you to think about something for just a moment. If an Old Testament saint, in the midst of all that affliction, 
and all that despair and truly living, living the, the reality of a faint hope in a devastated kingdom. If an Old Testament saint could declare the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The mercies of God are new every morning. And great is His faithfulness. How much more for those of us in this room on the other side of the cross. How much more, having seen what God has done for us in Christ, how much more can we not be assured of His love and His mercy and His faithfulness toward us? We see it there in your notes. How do, how do we know? How do we know of the love of God toward us? We see, for example, that Christ has endured the penalty of sin in the place of his people. How do we know? How do you know that God loves you? Other than some trite song or other than, other than something that you just naturally assume because we're such lovable people. How do we know that God loves us with a steadfast love? Because Jesus has shed His own blood for our sins. He has paid the penalty for our sins. He has endured. He has taken your wrath, your pain, your guilt, your punishment. He has taken them upon yourself, and then He has taken them to the cross, and He has died a bloody death to demonstrate, God says, to demonstrate that even while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. He died for us. How do you know? You say, I, I don't really feel the love of God. The answer is not to get worked up in some kind of emotional frenzy. You want to feel the love of God? You want to know the love of God? Spend some time reading His Word and seeing Christ crucified for you. How do we know the love of God? We look to the cross. How do we know... How do, how do the mercies of God come to us? Number two, we see that Christ has ensured the mercies of God for the sake of His people. Not only has He paid the penalty, He has also ensured the mercies of God for the sake of His people. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. Listen to this. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everything that you need, everything that I need, every grace, every mercy, every time, opportunity, every occasion of forgiveness, Jesus purchased it with his own blood. He has died on the cross, risen from the grave, and as a privilege to the resurrected Messiah, he now gets the, gets the honor of pouring out the blessings of God upon his people. And so he pours out mercy, and he pours out grace, and he pours out forgiveness, and he pours out every single thing that we need for our relationship with God. How do we know? How do we know that God loves us? We look to the cross. How do we know that we're going to get mercy? Because Jesus has died and triumphed over the grave. And how do we know? How do we know that God will be faithful to us? How do we know that, that when we come to God, God will certainly forgive us? Last, we see that Christ has entered the presence of God on behalf of His people. How do we know that God will forgive us because Christ has entered the presence of God on behalf of His people? Write this verse down. Lament, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It says, Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. I love that phrase. He is able to save to the uttermost. You say, I am far from God. He is further down the road. I is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. Speaking of Jesus, why? Since He always lives to make intercession for them. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what sins you've committed. I don't know how I don't know how you've made in your own mind a mess of your life. But I do know this. For those that repent of their sins and place all of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an advocate whose blood can make even the foulest clean. 
we have an advocate who ever, ever, ever lives to make intercession for you and me. Do you get that, brothers and sisters? Right now, as we are thinking about things that we should not think about, he is even now making intercession for you and for me. How do we know that we're going to make it? How do we know that we can come back to God, not by anything that we have, but because we have a faithful high priest who has gone into the heavenly places and he has presented not the blood of goats or animals, he has presented his very own blood. And now he is interceding on behalf of that blood. So let me close. Let me close with some, some encouragements, but also some challenges from what we've seen in the Word this morning. Number one, would you, would you trust in the character of God? Brothers and sisters, would you trust, would you believe that God is for you in Christ? Would you believe in your heart by the power of the Spirit, the help of the Spirit of God, would you believe in the steadfast love of the Lord? Would you believe that His mercies are new every morning? Believe that He is great in His faithfulness. Listen, don't look to yourself. Don't don't look and say, well, let me find something that's lovable, and, and therefore I'll know that God will love me. No, look to the God who is love. Don't look for reasons why God should show you mercy. There are none. Look only to Christ who has purchased those mercies for you. Don't look at your faithfulness. Look at the very faithfulness of God, that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Trust in the character of God. Two, confess the depths of your sins. Confess the depths of your sins. Romans chapter 2 says that the kindness of God or the patience of God is meant to lead us to repentance. You hear that? That the patience, the the, the long-suffering of God is meant to lead us to repentance so that when we hear, like we do in Lamentations 3, that God is long, that He is loving and merciful and He is faithful, that is meant then to lead us to turn away from what is not God to God and God alone. To confess the depths of our sin and last to bank on the mercies of Christ. To bank on the mercies of Christ. Having done that, having believed in the character of God, trusted in the character of God, repented of our sins, confessed the depths of our sins, would you then, would you then in honor of Christ, to bring glory to Christ and His work, would you then bank on His mercies? He says in John chapter 6, He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, And I love this line, and whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, how deep your failures, how broken your life. Whoever comes to me, he says, I will never cast out.